Welcome back to part two of Reinventing the Whale with me, Matt Harvey, Philippa Brakes and Joe Roman. We're talking about the ocean's mightiest creatures and how science is helping us reimagine them. The new science that's emerging, we know more about the role that whales play in ecosystems and, and the climate systems. So traditionally, and this would have been when I started my career, most of the focus on the ecological role of whales is what they ate and how much they ate. And there are hundreds of species, you know, of studies, and in part, sometimes that was to justify whaling. You know, to say, okay, whales are competitors. Um, if there are too many whales, then we're not going to have enough fish. And you can find that, you know, that that's been argued by various whaling cultures and from the '60s on. People are saying we've got to kill more whales because they're eating all our fish. Uh, you could definitely find that. There's still arguments of culling marine mammals, whales, and seals out there, absolutely, because they eat our fish, absolutely. Um, but from the early days when I've been out on the water studying these, I had noticed that there were other processes. I'm not the only one. Others were talking about there were other ways that whales could influence ocean ecosystems. Um, one is uh, through their the carcasses. When whales die and they sink to the deep sea, there are more than 100 species that are dependent just on dead whales. They survive, they, they, they feed on the bones, or they're, they don't even feed on them. These worms land on the bones, they don't have a mouth, they don't have a gut, they don't have an anus. They're, they are on the bones and they're absorbing the nutrients, giving it to the bacteria in, the, in their what's called a trophosome, and then using the sugars that come from that. And these were probably some of the first extinctions in the ocean were these deep sea creatures once the habitat disappeared, when we took out 90% of their habitat, it put these animals at risk. So that's, that's one that blew people's minds in like the 90s and 80s, that there was entire communities that we didn't even, or weren't even aware of. It was around the same time that hydrothermal vents were discovered too, that there were other communities that were found in the deep sea. Before that, people thought the deep sea was a desert. You know, there are lots of people have had argued that there was probably no life there because of pressures. So that's one way that I think whales are incredibly important. Also, we talked about the strandings, nutrients come onto land. And then the work that I've been doing since around 2000 or, or 2005 is, since my, the first time I saw whales, one of the first things I saw was a come to the surface, breathe. I'd had mud on its head and it, it, it dived maybe 200 meters beneath the surface just before um, it did its terminal dive it gave this a normal fecal plume right so right in front of me this and I thought that was interesting and uh, it took me a few years to think about whether that's important or as one of my colleagues said okay so you know they're they're pooping at the surface and there's probably some nutrients in there but is it ecologically important or is it a fart in a hurricane and really, I've been looking, trying to figure that out. And people would argue both of the, both ways on that. We've been trying to figure out how ecologically important is that. Both, both for the productivity in the system, as well as carbon sequestration, as well as providing, building up not only phytoplankton, but zooplankton and fish in the systems. So oh, that's a long answer to it's not just that they're feeding on fish, but they're actually playing another ecological role in providing these nutrient subsidies in areas where they're abundant. And we've spent, you know, there've been quite a few studies now looking at whatever we call the, the limiting factor, just like your garden, you might run out of nitrogen or phosphorus in the oceans, it can also be iron. These nutrients are abundant in these fecal plumes. And um, this, can, this can have an effect on those ocean ecosystems. Because people ask what, what whale feces looks like. And, just like with other animals, it can vary by what they're eating. So in some cases, if they're feeding on krill, it can be bright red and float at the surface in clumps. Or if they're feeding on fish, it can be quite dilute. And I describe it as oversteeped green tea. You can barely see it, but when we do a dip net in it, there's high, it's high, uh, there are high nutrients in that area. So, uh, but, but often it is sort of that flocculent, almost like woolly-like, um, appearance that that you can see in in in, in these plumes very pleasing uh, thank you for <laughs> oversteeped green tea that's going to stay with me you've really given us uh, a chapter and verse i like to think on why whale poo 
actually matters. It's more than a fart and a hurricane. That's hopefully, that's what you came down. It's much more than that. It's, um, the scale of it is significant enough to matter. Yes, and here in the area where I work, Gulf of Maine, it's more than um, all the um, rivers combined. Uh, all the nitrogen that comes from the rivers, which is a typical source, uh, whales, whales put more into that. And of course, be mindful, we've been talking about overhunting, that we're looking at an ocean that's really bereft of whales. I mean, they're, they, it's gotten better now, but by the 70s, I mean, we had taken out maybe 80% of the biomass, possibly up to 90% of all whales out of the oceans. Fortunately, the efforts that we're talking about, whaling moratoriums, Marine Mammal Protection Act, endangered species laws throughout the world, have allowed some whale species to come back. But still, they're, they're absent. You know, think, well, you, you're, you're in Europe. There used to be the North Atlantic right whale used to be abundant there. It's gone. Maybe an occasional individual comes there. So that we were talking about Basque whaling, that they've been depleted since whale, you know, for, for a couple of hundred years now and they haven't come back. So some areas, it's not surprising we don't think whales matter because they're not there anymore. Whales coming back is, some, is only just beginning, really. They haven't, we haven't replenished the whale, that, but they, we, we decimated, yeah. we, we took out, you know, on such a scale that they're only just beginning to return and haven't yet, really. Is that? Oh, absolutely. That's true for many species of whales. Some, like humpback whales, have done quite well. And um, as well, you know, as, as Philippa mentioned, they're, they're, these are long-lived mammals and they only have one calf, you know, every couple of years, typically. So it's going to take a while. You know, re restoration, recovery isn't going to happen overnight. It's been 50 years in the United States since we protected whales and the commercial moratorium started in the 1980s. So it's gonna take a while. The good news is for many species, that protection has resulted in dramatic increases. The bad news, and this I will circle back to what, what Philip had mentioned earlier about um, if we saw how painful it is for a whale to die offshore. And we, you know, we had seen a horse suffer that way on land. People would have resisted whaling. We're still doing that. There's indirect, whales are caught in fishing lines. They're run over by ships. The oceans are really noisy. They die from swallowing plastic. So remember, and this is, a, this is an animal welfare issue as well as a conservation issue. We're not off the hook because we stopped direct whaling. We have a lot more work to do. And we haven't even mentioned, you mentioned a little bit, you know, climate change is gonna have an impact on species across the globe. You know, as the, as the oceans warm in the Arctic or the Antarctic or in the tropics. And there's evidence for that already, isn't there? There's already evidence for shifting ranges. And yeah, so we're, we're only at the beginning of being able to see that difference. And, and just to, to touch again on Joe's point about getting caught in fishing nets you know we we sort of balk when we, when we listen to harry lily's um description of whaling from you know, more than 100 years ago but we know there is very good evidence that right whales can get entangled in lines and be entangled in those lines and suffer horrendous injuries for months so so we are still culpable for um you know bad things that happen in the oceans for whales and dolphins. So yeah, I, I agree. I think um, it's it's easy to be righteous about whaling and it's a little bit less easy to think about the sustainability of the fish that's arriving on your plate every day. So. Earlier, you used the word communities, not uh, partly about the, the, the creatures around the whale, but I think we, with emerging science, we are more aware of Wales own communities and Wales own culture as part of us sort of valuing the whale and part of us um, relating to the whale as a fellow mammal. Culture in the scientific sense or the way that we describe it when we we're thinking about non-humans is is basically arises as the result of information being socially learnt between a group of individuals. So that's something that we do all the time. It's something that we're doing right now as we're sharing information with each other. Um, and so 
It's also described as a second inheritance system. You know, we know quite a lot about genes and the ability, you know, the amazing, cool, incredible things that, that happen to genes through the processes of natural selection. Or well, cultural information can be shared in exactly the same or very similar ways, but it can happen on a within generational time scale or between generations. So it allows other animals, including ourselves, to uh, be able to be quite responsive to changes in our environments. And so we know that whales, one of the most obvious ways, I guess, sort of think, thinking back to sort of work that was done in the late 60s and 70s, one of the most obvious ways was, was listening to whale song. So there are, but there are various different behavioral domains in which whales share information. So there's song, but we're, actually we shouldn't just talk about whales, we should also talk about dolphins too. So, you know, dolphins share information on how to uh, forage, for example, and there's very good evidence of dolphins using tools, which might be surprising considering, of course, they don't have opposable thumbs, but they can use um, sponges, for example, which they put on the, their lower rostrum and they use to help sort of fossick around in uh, places that would otherwise be a little bit difficult to, uh, to actually get into, sort of crevices and sand to find other kinds of fish. Sort of, I kind of think of it as like protective gear. You know, they're very, very um, obviously aware of what, what they need to do in order to not injure themselves. And, and actually injuring yourself and bleeding in an environment where there's uh, sharks is, you know, is probably not optimal. So that might be one of the sort of driving factors as well as pain. But um, that information of, of learning to do that, one individual might innovate and learn to do something different. And where others, then see what that individual is doing and then copy it or as we say emulating it if you're trying to actually achieve the same goal um, yeah. that is social learning and social learning is really the process from which culture then evolves so we generally speaking don't aren't able to measure it depends on the species but for cetaceans certainly we don't generally measure um, social learning at that level. What we're generally measuring is the patterning that we then see in the natural world that arises from the social learning which creates the culture. Um, and so whales will, they share their migration routes with one another. We have, for example, in southern right whales in this part of the world, where there's very good evidence that southern right whale migration is maternally led so you basically you follow your mother on the migratory paths and those are then sort of hardwired into you and you carry on you know taking off on those migrations and it's that's a very good example of how uh, you know we were talking earlier about um, how some species have been able to recover quite quickly after whaling or maybe not quite quickly but faster than others after whaling and other species have been very slow to recover and for a long time we've not really known why that is we've been wondering well is it to do with is there sort of safety in numbers is it to do with their resource bases changed but with southern right whales we think one of the main factors is that those individuals who had knowledge about where critical feeding and breeding habitat was have been depleted from the population to such an extent that the full range of the species has not been realized again as the, as the populations have started to grow so it takes time to rebuild that cultural knowledge and you can imagine it'd be exactly the same for us you know if we if an asteroid came and and wiped out the vast majority of the human population and, and the internet and all the rest of it we would it would take us a long time to rebuild iphones wouldn't it so it's it's a similar sort of construct but for different um, you know different biological needs um, so yeah so there's a there's a whole host of ways in which whales and dolphins share information and the thing that I find most fascinating to think about really is if we go back to the right beginning of our conversation where we're talking about the fact that the early ancestors of whales were around 50 million years ago we know that sharing information socially and that culture has a very important biological role. It is therefore highly likely that social information has been shared for millions of years amongst whales and dolphins 
before humans arrived. So we don't have evidence for that though, but it seems uh, incredibly likely given its biological role. I and mean, we do have evidence for archeological evidence for stone cracking. Uh, so nut cracking with stones in chimpanzees in West Africa that goes back more than 4,000 years. So, you know, the, the, there is evidence that social learning has been important long before we started to even think about it, talk about it, measure it. So we're just, I think, oh, it's the absolute tip of the iceberg where we are at the moment in terms of our understanding about uh, the importance of shared information within communities and between communities. And it's really nice, I think, if you, or, or it helps us to remember our place in the biological system of Earth when we, we think about the chaos <laughs> that we've wrought in such a short period of time in comparison to, um, you know, the sustainable existence of many other species. Um, so I, and I, I, you know, one of, one of the things we were talking about previously was, uh, you know, what do, what do wells and dolphins think about us? You know, well, how do, how do they perceive us? And that's, that's, a, that's a, a very difficult question to answer. We can only conjecture that. Let's, let's it, conjecture. But I imagine that they think we're very busy, you know, that hmm. they, <laughs> Wherever we turn up, there's busy stuff happening. The oceans were, the, from a noise perspective, sound and noise, were very different. And then when we arrived, there's just we're just busy doing stuff the whole time and creating and making. And that's not to say that what we're doing isn't good sometimes, but comparatively, I think that that might be one of the things that they would consider us to be.